Mutant Chronicles, Fiction, The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy, Volume 3, Dementia, by Michael A. Stackpole. Chapter 34 The pale green reflections from the statue leaped off and enfolded Ragathal in a milky, translucent shroud. It draped itself over him, then enfolded him and lifted him into the air. The shroud rippled as if it were a liquid sphere and rose up into a crest as waves slid around the globe and collided with each other. It contracted slightly and appeared to have solidified, like an egg being boiled, yet it did not become opaque. Instead, it cleared to an emerald hue with which we could see Ragathal and two sinuous serpentine threads of pale green plasma. The glowing ribbons bound Ragathal's wrists and ankles together, then drew his arms against his chest and his legs up until the nephrite huddled in a fetal position at the heart of the emerald globe. Slowly, as if teased by unseen winds or carried by invisible fairies, the ribbons wound themselves around Ragathal. They grew more swift as they covered more and more of him. Within a minute or two, they had mummified him in an intricate plasma braid. Then, all the seams smoothed, and again his form lay encased in a pus-green skin. Things began to change at that point. The remaining spikes on his head atrophied and I thought I saw black holes open in his skull where they retreated. If they were there, they remained present only for a second or two, then were replaced by pulsing phallic things that stretched the green membrane. The cylindrical shapes shot in and out, first at the top of his skull, then down and out a temple or his forehead. They moved cautiously at first, then grew bolder, pushing and pushing against the elastic green film surrounding him. Suddenly, his arms pushed out from his chest, and cracks appeared in the emerald. His legs extended slowly, and his back hunched as he tried to straighten within his prison. More cracks appeared, popping and snapping like glass being ground beneath steel boots. Then he brought his head up. The emerald crumbled over his chest. Then his hands reached out and pushed the halves of the gemstone egg apart. The green tissue covering him split down the middle, and Ragathal emerged, glistening and dripping a crystalline liquid. His flesh had been drained of its livid, sanguine hue, and replaced with a greenish, corpse-like pallor. Where there had once been spikes, now huge, fat worms stuck their head forth and waved their mouths through the air. Leaner than he had been before, he bore no scars or signs of abuse he had endured at our hands. He gave us a lipless grin. It was insanity for you to come here. Now you shall have what you richly desire. This is the word of Glathor, Nephrite of Muaji. He gestured at us and the world went black for me. Yet I knew I had not lost consciousness. I found myself in a black void, looking at a small wooden simulacrum of myself. It looked like a marionette, and above me, wearing robes cut from a nightmare cloth, Glathor manipulated me. At his whim, I jerked and twitched. I capered around and around, casting my assault rifle from me, spinning and leaping, pirouetting and hopping down the causeway on my tiptoes. I tried to stop myself, but I could not. Looking up again at Glathor, I saw him raise a thin pipe to his mouth and somehow blow a tune out through it. His eyes writhed like worms in his head, coaxing a twisted, blasphemous song from the simple flute. I could not hear the song, but every fiber of my being responded to it. As commanded by the song of madness, my limbs flopped back and forth, utterly beyond my control. The sheer torque of some of the maneuvers threatened to tear my body apart from the inside. But the insane melody always prevented that from happening, and yet it promised that it would soon, sooner, soonest. From somewhere inside me, I heard a growl. The sound could not cut through the song driving my body, but it somehow wrapped itself around the notes and began to insulate me from their influence. The tune has been called, it said. 
Now it is time for the piper to be paid. From the darkness of my mind, an ebon and silver warrior congealed. Insane fire flamed from his eyes like muzzle flashes. With a hand shaped like razor daggers, he threw a brief salute and then turned and leapt at the image of Glathor. Suddenly, I recognized the warrior leaping to my defense. Parabellum Rex, stripped of anger and aggression by our partial reintegration, still possessed my total capacity for hatred. Had I thought about it, I might have noticed that I did not hate Scythia for killing me, or Wynne Raleigh for his repeated attempts to kill his daughter. I did not hate Ezeguls or Razids, or the other denizens of the Dark Legion, and it was not because they were not worthy of hatred, or I was incapable of seeing how much they deserved to be hated. I could not hate them because Parabellum Rex was my hatred. Parabellum Rex's claw slashed into Glathor, and the tune faltered. Ribbons of Glathor floated out into the void like tatters of a wind-shredded flag in a gale. Parabellum Rex clawed and dug, bit and scratched, gnawed and gouged. With each strike, a note sounded sour and ended prematurely, creating a gap in the song. In those infinitesimal silences, I felt my body again, and I tried to make myself stop dancing madly. The dancing marionette had drawn his punisher and sought vainly to aim it at Glathor, but he could not, even though the puppet jerked with starts and stops of the music. Each hole in the song failed to come when the gun pointed at him. The long tendrils of Glathor began to blow beyond Parabellum Rex's glittering fingers and weave themselves back together behind him. As they did so, the tune became more coherent again. Parabellum Rex leaped up to snip at bits of Glathor, but the Nephirite had risen above his reach. The silver and black figure fell back to the unseen earth, then dropped to one knee. I saw his chest heaving and the fires in his eyes receding until they only licked at his eyebrows. Rex looked over at me. Help me, help us. I cannot win, but we will prevail. I reached out to Parabellum Rex and flowed into him as if I were fluid being poured into a mold. As I geysered up into his hollow head, he granted me the last of the memories I did not possess. They exploded in my brain like a satchel charge yet they did not bring a destruction with them. Instead, they gave me healing and completeness. With them, with the total integration of who I was and what I had become, I knew I was not insane. Parabellum Rex's memories did not begin with my death and resurrection, as I had supposed before. He had been born when Scythia's fist slammed into my spine, crushing vertebra. I had resisted her, refusing to tell her where Cassandra Raleigh and her husband had gone. As she had done with the heretic, she titillated me, cajoled me, and threatened me. She told me I would talk once I could not walk, but I refused to speak, so she crippled me. With that single blow, she brought Parabellum Rex to life. His job, as he saw it, was to preserve us and resist her. He gained my hatred and aggression, and combativeness, but he did not take my memories. He could not have told Scythia where Cassandra had gone, because he did not know. He laughed in her face, knowing he would frustrate her forever. And when she killed us, and then Cybertronic brought us back to life, he remained in control and resisted learning anything that might give him the information she so dearly desired. Then, when the image of Muaji touched me at Larkspur, Parabellum Rex attacked the seed of insanity that the Apostle had planted in my brain. Rex stripped off things like aggression and pugnacity, leaving himself nothing but pure hatred. He swarmed over the seed, crushed it, and devoured it. Like a macrophage, he learned to recognize Muaji's spoor and lay in wait for it to come again so he could destroy it. I cranked my head back and saw Glathor standing above me, breathing lunacy through his pipe. I stabbed my right hand upward, willing my arm to grow long. My bladed fingers sliced up into him. They minced and diced him, 
pushing up beyond his intestines through his liver and heart and lungs. They coursed along his spine and up through his soft palate. Firmly lodged in his brain, I began to twiddle my fingers, blending gray matter and worms into a lifeless puree. My index finger tightened spasmodically, and again, I spun to the ground and slammed into the statue of Muaji. I saw Glathor staggering backwards with two bullet wounds in his face. As he caught himself and started to step toward me, the crisp staccato of Hunter's M50 filled the chamber. From his knees, Hunter kept the assault rifle on target and bullet holes stifled Glathor's chest. Brackish black fluid began to ooze from the holes, but somehow the Nephirite remained on his feet and staggering forward when Hunter paused to reload. Yojimbo's sword slash caught Glathor below the jaw and swept through his neck as if the Nephirite had been no more substantial than a wraith. Glathor's mouth hung open in surprise, then slowly began to spin as a writhing worm outweighed it. The body buckled at the knees, hit them hard on the stone floor, then flopped onto its back. I holstered the Punisher and looked over at my two companions. Blood dripped from Yojimbo's sword and steamed on the ground. Smoke slowly settled around Mitch as the last of the brass cartridges spun to a stop off to his right. We got him. Mitch stood and pointed his gun at the body. What happened to him? Yojimbo shook his head. I don't know. He started glowing and then... Wait, he's glowing again. I turned back toward the body and saw Yojimbo was right. The green glow had begun again, but before it could cover the body, a reddish fungus covered the corpse and dissolved it. What in hell? The red fungus collapsed in a black pool that then rose up in a dark mist. That mist swirled around, then solidified itself into a huge humanoid figure. Even more heavily muscled than Ragathal had been, this being had cables and tubes running across his red flesh. A red gold battle mask covered his face, or so I thought, until I saw the metal begin to move and tighten like flesh. I saw parts of his skin shimmer like liquid crystal displays, and arcane data flashed across their surfaces, as if he were some living union of organic creature and machine. A huge, primal, and terrible godling who had fashioned a Cybertronic chasseur like me in his image. The black mask contorted itself into a pitiless grin. Blessed are thee, bellicose and lethal. You stand before Algaroth, the apostle of war, and you have pleased him. Mutant Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 3 Dementia by Michael A. Stackpole Chapter 34 End <laughs>